You know, one thing I think that is important to note is what customers want these days, in my opinion, right, are brands and products that, you know, not only that they resonate with, but really answer the question of like, why is this product around? Why is this brand around? Brands these days, the ones that are really winning and succeeding are really answering that question. And customers are able to understand that it's not a company out there just like trying to make money or trying to hawk you a product, but they have a reason behind doing what they're doing. All right, hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. I'm here on a nine, a non-live edition of the traditional video podcast. Uh, and I'm super excited to have a good friend of mine, Alex Brown, CMO of DFO, one of the largest e-commerce players in the world. Uh, he is coming to us live from his San Diego office, and he's going to be live on stage in Barcelona uh, on, December, on July 10th and 11th. I've said it enough. Uh, coming up. And I'm super excited. We have him talking about a really interesting topic that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, which is how to pick a good product, what makes a good product, some of the logistics that go into those products. Uh, and we're going to tease a little bit of it today, but we got lots, uh, you know, lots else to talk about. As Alex is at the heart of a marketing engine of one of the biggest e-commerce marketing forces in the world, DFO. Welcome to the Robust Market. How are you doing, Alex? Yeah, doing great, Eric. It's great to be back with you again. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Nice. Uh, okay, so let's just jump right into it here. Like, what are you? So, what's DFO's like main focus these days? What, like, I know with big companies, you're always sort of like you, you have a, a large mission statement that you're pursuing overall. But what what are some of the smaller like pivots you're seeing in this space right now? Yeah, well, I mean, right now it's a really exciting time for us. Um, you know, obviously, as we all tool up and like gear up for Q3 and Q4, which are you know where most of us make you know the bulk of our revenues, but you know, for us, um, it's a time for expansion. So we recently acquired um, a former um, partner of ours, a company called Ad Tactics, and basically brought on a number of, of their staff to um, join forces with us. So it's really been a lot about bringing them into the fold. We um, basically got a new chief strategy officer and a new lead media buyer um, with our acquisition of them. So it's been really exciting to, again, bring them into the fold and learn, you know, basically a lot about how, you know, they run their, you know, media campaigns and a lot of their strategy as well. So, you know, with that too, we've also opened up two new offices, one in Brisbane, Australia, um, and we have five new media buyers out there. Um, and actually right now I have a media buyer in San Diego who just joined us from right outside of Tel Aviv. Very cool. So, so our global footprint, um, establish our roots all over the world. Um, and you know we're really just back product for um, Q3 and Q4, um, as well as you know really trying to grow the agency side of our business. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, DFO um, basically merged with Agency Y, um, you know, the the brainchild of Tim Bird um, about a year ago, and so. We've still been, you know, relatively boutique, really taking on only a handful of clients um, that, you know, really are closely aligned with what we're trying to do. But we see um, we see that becoming a much larger part of our um, our business and are really trying to grow and expand that. So you'll hear more about that in Barcelona as well. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to grow that piece of our business as well. It, it must be a real challenge for the upper management at DFO to, to think about the ways that you want to grow because you have such a comprehensive ecosystem it feels like from like product sourcing to manufacturing to you know all aspects of e-commerce you guys seem to cover uh and so you're, you're sort of there's all, a lot of different ways you can expand obviously media buying and and what you're able to like you know what you're able to just bring to other businesses from a media buying perspective and even potentially from an operational perspective seems like the agency is a no-brainer for growth yeah for sure um i mean i think for us right like there's no shortage of opportunities, and I think that's the hardest part, right, is like trying to figure out which are the best opportunities to really go after. And I mean, I think I'll, I'll touch on this too in Barcelona. Um, again, it boils down to even like which products to pick, right, because there are so many great opportunities. Um, the landscape for e-commerce is changing so rapidly that there's so many different things you can focus on. Um, and it's hard to know what, you know, is an opportunity to be seized and what is, 
you know, sort of, um, you know, something that, you know, a threat or something that you need to avoid. Um, there's actually a good quote about that. I think I just butchered it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to pick what are, you know, the best opportunities to really pursue when you really kind of can and want to do everything. Yeah, I imagine that is a, a big a big challenge. Now, what in, in terms of your products that you guys actually produce, do you have a hit rate? Do you know sort of like what percent? I guess that hits are at your scale are you know on a varying scale, right? You could have a total runaway smash international product that you know that goes forever kind of thing. Like, what's your? How do you sort of view the the success rate of your the products that you guys create and promote? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I'd say like. I don't have like a clear metric just to like throw out. Um, I, I wish we did. Um, perhaps we probably should, but you know, I think for us, it, it's much more about like we try to go into each product, um, you know, and kind of like roll them out in phases, right? So we kind of look for certain key metrics at varying phases of the product rollout, um, and this is definitely something I'll touch on in Barcelona. Um, so I don't want to give away too much, but you know, again, we're trying to at each step kind of like invest the minimum amount necessary to really um, get the key data that we need to move the product onto the next phase. So rather than just saying, hey, we have a great idea for a product that we're super bullish on, let's go, you know, let's let's invest all of our time, our bandwidth, let's go buy, you know, thousands of units of this and, and really, you know, sometimes invest months before we're able to, you know, roll it out and start seeing if it will resonate with our with our audience we almost do it a little bit in reverse, right? Where we try to, again, sort of just like poke into the market a little bit, see, you know, where we're getting bites and, you know, identify a market. And then from there, sort of reverse engineer into the product. So, um, you know, that's kind of our way of going about it. I think, yeah, and at your scale, you'd have to break it down into into those kind of steps. And it's, I'm really excited to hear more about the process. If anyone wasn't or hasn't seen the replay or wasn't around for, which one was it? I, I, we've done so many recently, but it was your Vegas talk, I think, that was all about direct site media buying. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one yep. of my favorite talks of the day, and you know, I, you're really, I think you're really uh, spreading your wings as a speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm super psyched to hear your, your talk in Barcelona as well. So now, so like, talking about the ad tactics purchase, I'm really curious, like what was, because you guys have had a lot of ad intelligence in-house. I'm wondering, like, what were some of the reasons behind the acquisition? What is this acquisition allowing you guys to do? And in the same breath, what does it say about the industry as a whole? Yeah, I mean, well, I can tell you that, you know, the ad tactics guys were very, very close partners of us for a very long time. And we'd been very impressed with, you know, their ability to, again, um, you know, they, they were very strong in SEO and also in SEM, two areas where, of course, we see, you know, a, a big need to kind of expand our footprint. Um, I think, as many people will probably agree, like Facebook is becoming so much more volatile these days. And you know, part of the reason why I'm so bullish on direct site buys and these other partnerships are really to again have a foundation that you can rely on. While again, you know, going for those moonshots on Facebook as as frequently as you possibly can, right? But not having to rely on them. And so yeah. the ad tactics guys really bring um, you know not only a team but technology that will enable us to really scale out our SEO and SEM footprints. Um, and you know, plus the fact they're just really awesome guys and, um, you know, again, have proven themselves time and time again to be really strong partners of ours. So, you know, we're always looking for that sort of alignment and when we can find, you know, key partners that we can, you know, work more closely with or potentially even, you know, merge with or acquire. Um, I mean, we're always, we're always interested in those conversations. Very cool. Uh, yeah, yeah so I can see, so the ad tactics, broadening your omni-channel approach, uh, talk a little bit about brand and the way that you're the you know a, a DFO's um, thinking on both brand and content is sort of evolving over time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think those two things are are key and are going to be like, you know, how everything's in e-commerce sort of evolves now as we you know move through you know 2019 and beyond. Um, it's really, um, I mean, it's just really the way you have to go. Um, I mean, now again are we gonna go out and promote sort of like OEM or white labeled products like here and there when we spy an opportunity? Like, of course, like there's no reason why not to, but our focus has really been around, you know, identifying products not only that we can protect through, you know, protecting their, you know, their trademarks and patents, um, as well as the intellectual property around them, but also, um, you know, to ensure that 
we you know can create that valuable content that will will resonate with users. So um, you know one thing I think that is important to to note right is what customers want these days, in my opinion, right, are brands and products that you know not only that they resonate with, but really answer the question of like why is this product around? Why is this brand around? You know Simon Sinek, um, who's you know a famous author and speaker, you know has this. You know, great monologue where he talks about how you have to start with why, right? And I think brands these days, um, the ones that are really winning and succeeding, um, you know, are really answering that question. And customers are able to, you know, understand that it's not a company out there just like trying to make money or trying to hawk you a product, but they have a reason behind doing what they're doing. Um, and again, that enables you to build out all sorts of like amazing and awesome content um, that doesn't really feel like it's pitching people. Um, and that, you know, consumers really can resonate with. And, um, you know, th so that's what we're looking to do moving forward. Make those kinds. So that's that's going to be an interesting challenge, right? Because I feel like a lot of these brands, they come from someone's mind spring. They have an idea. They see a problem in the space. You guys have mm. so many employees. You have so many people on this kind of thing. But I'm interested, like, what's the creative process for sort of coming up with these brands that have a why or these like really sort of content rich brands? What does that look like in the organization? Yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of an all hands on deck, um, you know, uh, team, team effort. You know, I think, again, it kind of starts with identifying these pockets and these holes in the market, right? And, you know, again, I'll, I'll go into this a lot in Barcelona, really thinking about how we, you know, identify these, you know, holes in the market and, you know, products that can go and fill those needs. But, you know, one thing I, you know, and this is kind of a digression, but one thing I wanted to talk about was, you know, when I'm seeing like key trends out there in the market, it's really about reinventing these these everyday use products that and really making them cool and making them customized for you as like as the individual. Right. So like some examples that I can think of just off the top of my head, like, you know, Quip, Brooklinen, Care of, Stitch Fix, like these again are, are products like Care of, like these are vitamins, right? Yeah. Like people take vitamins like every day. but you know, making this like a customized, cool product that you, you again are, you know, you're eager to share with your friends and like kind of show off that like, hey, this is me and I take care of my body in this specific way. Like, I mean, these are the type of products that I think are really, you know, really, really succeeding. So, and these are like everyday products. I mean, it, you can get like even potted plants, like people are getting these like, you know, customized and shipped to their house now. So. I think like one, you know, key area that, you know, all advertisers should be looking at, you know, regardless of their their niche or their vertical is again, how do you take your specific product, you know, really make it cool and really make it customizable for for your audience because that's what they're looking for. I, I think that's entirely right. And I think that I think native, like native deodorants, the the, the company that spun up in a year oh, and sold for a mm -hmm. billion dollars or whatever. Uh, I, I love that example because it's like, it's like the old way is like you create a product, you create a brand, and then you do all these things to bring people to that brand. But that sort of way of branding is, is, is becoming yeah, passe it's, it's in reversed. some ways, right? It's sort yeah. of reversed. It's like now you can make these micro brands that speak to specific audiences make them feel cool about deodorant for some reason. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think there's that opportunity across multiple spaces and especially consumables. Like I love the idea of consumables obviously as well. As well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could talk long and hard about CBD and all of that, too. But, um, you know, the other thing, too, is I think it's really about identifying a cause. Right. So products that have a cause behind them, whether it's like mental health, whether it's, um, you know, uh, abuse or autism or anything like that, like people want to be able to be buying products that support a cause like that. So, um, again, any way that you're able to tie in what you're doing to a cause is going to really, you know, set you apart from the competition and just make it much easier for you to get that sort of, um, you know, low hanging fruit in terms of, you know, viral virality and also in terms of like organic reach. Can we can we take a little derivation into CBD town? Uh, almost, <laughs> almost like uh, what what are you seeing in that space right now? I see there's a lot of interest. It seems to be a game for, like that I that from my perspective of getting email addresses and, and a lot of it's happening on the back end through email, a lot of the sales are happening because there's not a lot of front end places you can advertise it. There's there's not, although I mean, I know that Facebook and Google are now basically saying that, you know, as long as the product is, you know, made in the United States and distributed in the United States, obviously, you know, Canada is its own can of worms up there. But, um, 
you know, that they're, that they're allowing it. So, um, I mean, we, you know, for us at DFO, it's sort of been a, you know, an area that we've been looking at, um, really closely for a long time. Obviously we want to make sure that we're, you know, playing within, you know, all of the right, you know, you know, legal framework. Um, and as long as it's still federally, you know, um, criminal, you know, we're, we're going to be cautious about it. But, um, I mean, it's, it's very exciting. It's obviously a huge industry and, um, we've got a very close eye on it right now. That, that's very, that, that rings true to my heart. And I may have said this in the last interview because I was from one of the, you know, you guys are one of the biggest players. You've been around so long and you don't stay around and get that big by taking a ton of risks. You know, and this is this was similar to Neverblue back in in my day and, and Global Wide. Mm -hmm. After they they were very good at not you know they never went full in on acai and and or things that that really ended up bringing a lot of heat. And so they were able to just grow stably. And I think it's just the best way to do business overall. Look, I can tell you, there's a ton of people out there that are crushing it, making tons of money on CBD. And you know, I think that that's great for them, right? Yeah. Um, it it's not you know our specialty is e-commerce. Yeah. Right. And now, of course, there's like a ton of products we could make and we could really try to like leverage that, you know, this this trend and, you know, tap into this you know vein. But I think for now, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're cautious and we're, we're playing within all the, the proper legal confines. And, um, you know, I think at the right moment we will we will strike when the uh, when the iron is hot. Sounds mm -hmm. like the art of war. And, and you'll be fully aligned yes. and ready to go and ready to scale, which is the beauty of working in such sure. a, a, a mm -hmm. strong organization. Uh, okay, so what else do we have here? I love this idea of the the trend, the why that these brands are, are, are bringing to the table. People want you know other things they can associate with their identity. Um, what is so? Yeah, we're reinventing things. Have you ever have you seen much in the way of like a lot of people are talking about dynamic front ends to e-commerce products and things like quizzes or li, you know like sure. obviously listicles, things like this. What are you mm -hmm. seeing in terms of like the content going in front of the offers, sort of on your network, for instance, that that are working? Yeah, I mean, again, people love answering questions, um, especially if it's like them giving little bits of information about themselves. Um, you know, Andy. when I used to, yeah, I mean, when I used to work at Instant Checkmate, um, you know, one of the largest background check sites in the world, I mean, our funnel was like 20 minutes long and basically consisted of people giving little bits of information about who they are, or the person they were looking for. Um, and it just really drew them in and it made them feel so much more invested. And so you can really take that um and apply it to a lot of different products and services, right? Um, you know, whether it's a quiz, you know, hey, are you, you know, what type of, you know, products or vitamins or, or things do you like to take? Um, what type of food do you eat? Are you on a keto diet? Um, asking people little bits, tidbits of information like this gets them invested. And obviously then you can really segment your audience and your lists and, you know, deliver them, you know, the most targeted offer for, you know, their own preferences. I mean, I know guys like, um, you know, Max Finn and, you know, the unicorn guys are doing that at a very, very high level. Um, but yeah, I mean, people love to engage with content. And so whatever, whether it's a quiz, whether it's, um, you know, like a short survey or a listicle, um, you know, I, that stuff tends to work very well. It seems like a no brainer, especially for anyone promoting things, um, with a network where, where you can also begin to build your own list of things as well mm -hmm. and be able to hit people back. And it seems like, like a, a, an evolution that, that, that I think will help the industry quite a bit. And it also will help with the, the whole, the personalization angle that we're talking about being so essential to, to making sales these days. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, payments. This is something I talked, I talked with Chase just the other day, Chase Harmer from pay certify. Um, but I think this, this is another area where we're seeing a lot of rapid innovation. Uh, what's, what are you seeing in the payment space and what do you predict sort of in the next five, 10 years in that space? You know, again, we want to make, we want to make it as simple as possible for a user to convert. Um, you know, DFO has our own, you know, uh, technology that we've built our own CRM that has some, some pretty, you know, complex, uh, you know, payment solutions within it, some pretty cool FinTech, but I think what I really see coming in the future is again, you know, the ability to check out like one one click, you know, checkouts similar to Amazon across all different types of e-commerce stores. I think that Venmo will be, um, you know, widely adopted, especially when you're able to integrate that into e-com stores. And I think we're seeing that that might be possible as soon as like 2020. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, 
the ability, of course, as you know, a millennial to go through a, a pro, you know, go through a funnel, see what I want, immediately tap out with my uh, Venmo account would be, you know, I would be buying a ton more shit if that were the case. So, um, you know, again, we want to make payments as as easy and as seamless as possible, um, and you know, however we can do that, whether it's through like Apple Pay, whether it's through Venmo, whether it's through you know, Instagram is obviously off, you know, offering their own, you know, payment solution. So. Um, yeah, it'll be exciting times once once we get um, greenlit for all of that. Yeah, what, what's your take on the whole? This is something that I've I've worked into a couple of pitch I've been working on my agency side. What do you think of the uh, you know the Amazon Echo? You know, you know that the whole thing like, hey, Amazon, buy me this, or like the people that really like. And I, I'm <laughs> curious about like, are all your products on Amazon as well as well as Google Shopping? Like, do you when you say omni-channel, do you mean mm-hmm. like the full thing? Yeah, so so definitely yes. Um, the first thing I'll say on that Amazon Echo thing is I think that's cool, but it's also very dangerous having like a two and a half year old who uh, can now shout shout things at uh, at Amazon. Yeah, hey Alexa, I know. you know, I I start getting all sorts of random orders at my door. But um, yeah. but no, I mean, look, we have to have total coverage. Um, you know, our preference is always to be selling products. Um, you know direct response through Facebook. It's where we make the highest margins. It's where we can take people through our upsell funnel and, you know, really kind of, you know, maximize our AOVs. But um, at the same time, there's going to be drop off. And you, if you don't have Google shopping, if you don't have Amazon set up, you're leaving money on the table. And so we want to make sure we have, you know, kind of full spectrum, full coverage. And that, you know, if you want to buy one of our products, you can buy it wherever. So, um, yeah. We'll take your money. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Okay, yeah. cool. So let's talk a little bit about Barcelona. You've hinted at what you'll be talking about, but give us the sort of summary of what you're bringing to the table uh, July 10th, July 11th, I believe, in Barcelona. Cool. So, I mean, obviously DFO, you know, we picked um, some pretty solid, you know, e-com products over the years. So, um, and but we've also evolved in how we go about picking those products, right? So, I mean, I think I'll first stop, start by talking about like, you know, why picking the most, the, you know, the right product is so important. What happens if you don't, right? Um, and, you know, I'll go into a little bit about, you know, some of the consumer psychology behind, you know, uh, why people pick a product, because I think that's really important. But um, I'll really kind of go deep into, you know, DFO's method for um, rolling out and testing products. Right. So again, I hinted at it a little bit here. We have these multiple phases as we like roll out products. Um, but again, you know, it even starts at like, you know, the checklist that we run through when we're trying to decide before we even test a product. So we'll ask, you know, at least like 20 different questions of the product, um, you know, such as does it save a customer money? You know, can they use it every day? Is it compliant with ad networks? Um, we have a pr- pretty long checklist that we will run products through and we'll actually give them a score. And so based on that, um, you know, we'll take products that have sort of the highest ranking score and really put those into kind of our testing queue. And um, from there, obviously, based on how they perform at each step of the testing process, we'll either, you know, uh, you know, optimize them, we'll either, you know, kill them and, you know, send them back to the graveyard or in many cases we'll fast track them and and move them all the way through to, you know, full offer development and rollout. So, um, I'll kind of give you guys the the high level overview of how we do that. Um, you know, as well as like, you know, personally my checklist for what I think makes a good product. So I have, you know, again, a short list of, you know, kind of key things from a marketing lens that I like to look for and I will, um, be given all the, all the insight there. I think this is going to be another one of those hit topics. I think it's an area that we haven't really covered a lot of. We sort of, we sort of, a lot of the content is based on people already having the products, already having a brand built out. Mm. But I think that, I think especially in Europe last year, we had a lot more people on the newer sort of end of the spectrum, affiliates and drop shippers and things like that. So I think, uh, I think this topic will be a huge hit with everyone. So I can't I think, wait to, uh, to hear it. Yeah. I mean, look, here's the last thing I'll say is that, you know, And we get a lot of like great speakers who talk about, you know, different ways to sort of hack Facebook and the different, you know, um, strategies that they employ and different methods of CBO and, you know, different, you know, scaling methods. But at the core of it, right, if you have a really good product, like people want to buy your shit, like they want to buy your product. And so if you like that's the first thing that people need to figure out is, you know, again, it just makes your job so much easier as a marketer. If you have a product that's in demand and is desired that people want 
that has a backstory, that has a reason why, that maybe supports a cause. So it's really the blending of all of these things together. Um, and again, utilizing some of those awesome strategies that you get from guys like Tim or, or Max. Um, and, but it's the combination of those things that really help you, you know, take things to the, you know, the absolute stratosphere. So um, looking forward to obviously sharing, you know, my insight and, and what I can. Um, hopefully it's valuable and uh, it'll be exciting to see everyone out there. Super cool. All right. Well, go to iStackTraining.com right now and navigate through to our, our most recent event in Barcelona. Join us there. It's going to be an amazing two days. I can't wait. Alex, uh, we'll see you in Barcelona. Looking forward to it. See you guys there. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>